Oh, come on, let's give him praise. Let's give him glory. For he is worthy to be praised. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we honor you. Lord, we adore you. Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Oh, come on, lift your hands to him. Magnify him. Adore him. For there is truly none like him in all the earth. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We adore you. We honor you. We love you. Lord, we thank you. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We thank God for his love and his mercies towards us. We thank him for bringing us into his house one more time. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice, and we will be glad in it. If you are excited about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, just put in the chat, I am excited. I am excited to know that I worship the true and living God, that there is none like him in all the earth, from the rise of the sun to the going down of the very same. His name is worthy to be praised. His name is worthy to be adored. And we thank him tonight. Lord, we honor you. We bless you. We thank you for all that you're doing, all that you're about to do. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for we know that we have, you have all things in your hands and that there is nothing outside of your control. Father, so we bow ourselves to you this evening in reverence, knowing that you are God and God alone. Have your way tonight, I pray, Lord. We know that your word is anointed. We know that your word can break yokes. We know that your word could change around circumstances. We know that your word, Lord God, could change the heart of any individual. So I pray, Lord God, that you'll have your way tonight. Move by your power and by your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I am safe. I am loved. I am healed. I want to say that we, we have the best praise and worship team and musicians, I believe, on this side of heaven. Just put your hands together for our, 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 our praise and worship team, our musicians. We, I believe that they are doing a fabulous, fabulous job, and we thank God for Sister Nadia and the team that is working, and also our media staff and our sound and everything that happens behind the scenes. If it wasn't for them, we definitely would not have this type of experience to come before you every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time we have a service. But we thank God for their service, for their time, and allowing, just allowing us to, to, to use up their time. Bless the Lord. Brother Stefan has a family he wants to get back to, but we hold him here captive until time. Amen. But we thank God for everyone in the building. Uh, let's turn our Bibles to, to Job chapter number one. We're going to go back into the Job experience. This will be part number two. Job chapter number one. Job chapter number one. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to look at verse 11 through to 22. I know that is a lengthy read, but we, we're, we're going to compile some verses together so that uh, we're not here until 12 o'clock, all right? Amen. Job chapter 1, verses 11 through 22. Hope you got your Bibles with you and grab a pen and paper. As we, as we travel through. I told Pastor this evening, Pastor, I like to talk if you don't mind. He said, you have all right to do whatever you want to do tonight. I said, all right. Um, but when you're a preacher, you kind of know it may not hold back too long, but we're going to do our best this evening. Job chapter 1, verse number 11. But reach out your, but reach out with your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. But the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not reach out and put your hands on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now on the day when, the sons, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, 
a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the female donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked them and took them. They also killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While the other one had not finished saying what he was saying, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three units and made a raid on the camels and took them and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While all three were still talking, another one came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell on the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Underline this, highlight this. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Despite all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. I was struggling with a topic, really, for this evening, and... Truthfully, I had to ask my wife if you think pastor will allow me to use this as a topic. And with great discussion and great debate, I decided to go another way. And just for a subtopic, I like to use when the enemy invades. When the enemy invades. Brother Andrew, I'm going to need you to follow me all the way through. We're going to try to talk this all the way through tonight. When the enemy invades when the enemy invades. In James chapter number five, verse number 11, the brother Jesus writes this, he says, we count those blessed who endured, who have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. The word endure there comes from two Greek words, which means under. The first word means under. The second word means to remain. So to remain under. The example of that would be to persevere, to endure, to, in, to, to sustain, to bear up under, to suffer as a load of minis, uh, um, misery or adversity or persecutions. In other words, it's saying to, to remain under such things, to, to endure such pain, to endure such misery, to endure such persecutions. So James ultimately was saying, listen, we count those who have endured. We, we, we count those like Job who, who went through what he had to go through. But at the end of the day, the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. There's a quote that I read from Watchman Nee that says this. Everyone who believes in God must have his revelation in his spirit or else what he believes is not God but mere human wisdom, ideas, or words. Such a faith cannot endure the test. In other words, you need to have a personal relationship with Christ in order to endure the tests that will come your way. Everyone who believes in God must have his revelation in their spirit. It must be planted. It must be sown. It must stay in there 
Because if you do not, when you go through tests and when you go through trials, you're not going to you're not going to be able to endure simply because your roots are not grounded in God. Once again, Job says we count those blessed who endured, who have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. In James chapter number one, verse 12, in the same book, the same, the brother of Christ, he writes this, blessed is a man who preserves under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Once again, blessed is a man who preserves under trial. The King James Version will say temptation. For once he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to them who love him. The definition there of temptation there is trial or to make a trial of, to try, to tempt. Temptation, to put to the test spoken of persons only when when God is the one that is that, that is ushering this test it is for the purpose of proving someone never for the purpose of causing them to fall I need you to understand this that God never puts us through tests that will cause us to fall but he is proving us he is trying our character he is trying who we are to make us better. If it is the devil who tempts us, then it is the purpose to cause us to fall. Generally, the word means trial of one's character. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he, he simply states, and I'm paraphrasing, to try or to prove you. By implication, trial of one's virtue. In other words, what, 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 what he's saying here is that whenever God is going to test any of us, he's not testing us so that we fall into sin, but he's testing our character in him. Our character in him. This brings us back now to Job chapter number one. And in case you didn't watch part one, uh, allow me, allow me uh, just to give you a quick uh, uh, overview or review of what it is that, that we talked about. We, we talked about the character of Job. We talked about the fact that he was a family man. We, we talked about the fact of his possessions and his status and his religious stance. We, as a matter of fact, in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Job, it goes on to say, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. So we understand that Job was an upright man, and we, and we understood that word upright means perfect, but not in the sense of total perfectness. But Job was one that came the closest to being perfect in God's eye than anybody else could. The Bible says that he has seven sons and three daughters who were born to him. This was the perfect picture family in those days. He had seven strong sons, three beautiful daughters. They talked about his possessions of also having 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And we understood that a man in those days where his worth was really tied into the possessions in which he had. When we tally that all together, some scholars say everything that Job chapter 1 verse 2 or verse 3 rather, all these livestock that he has equaled approximately $4.6 million. His status was that he was, he was the greatest of all men of the East. This Job had everything going for him. And the lesson that we learned was the fact that we are able to have everything that God desires, where we are allowed and we have the privilege of obtaining great things in life, but we have to have character. That it is possible 
to have the house. It is possible to have the car. It is possible to have all these things, but we have to have character. Not only that, but it showed us that it is possible to live a godly life amongst an ungodly world. Job was the example of that. So much so that not only did the author of the book write about the character of Job, but, but Job himself in, in the book talked about his own integrity. A friend of Job talked about the character of Job. But more importantly, God spoke about the character of Job. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what they'll do to you. But if you know what God has said about you, you can walk with your head up high knowing that you are all right in the eyes of God. Amen. Then there was a meeting, verse 6 and 7, there, there was a meeting in heaven. The Bible says that on this day the, the sons of God came together, which represents the angels, but they had a special guest that came in, an unwanted guest that came in, and it was Satan that came in the midst of them. The word Satan, we understood, meant adversary. In the verb, it means block. And we talked about this. We understand that the devil still has access to glory to accuse the saints and to block our praise and our worship. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know that no matter what the enemy tries to do, no matter what the enemy tries to put in our way, if we are determined to see God move, we're going to push past everything the devil puts up to block us, and we are going to worship our God. So Satan was there with the saints, and God asked him the question, where are you coming from? Then Satan answered, Lord, going to and fro the earth, and from walking up and down it. But this is the interesting thing I want us to look at in verse number 8. While he answered all of that, the Lord said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? It wasn't the enemy that brought up Job. It wasn't the angels that brought up Job. It was God that brought Job into the mind of Satan. Then God decided to, you know, I'm going to brag on Job that Job here is none like him in all the earth. A perfect man. And an upright man. One that fears God and hates evil. But then the enemy says something in verse 9 that really warrants us to take a look at in our own lives. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you, worship you, reverence you for nothing? And it's interesting that the enemy would say that. And I, I, I want to break into something here about the ancient Near Eastern ideologies that they have. In the ancient Near Eastern world, people believed that gods were initially quite content to live without human beings, that gods had created the cosmos and the world and for themselves, and they lived together in community. As time went on, however, they grew tired of feeding themselves, clothing themselves, building houses for themselves, digging ditches for crop growth was now considered heavy labor. Therefore, they decided to create human beings as slaves. The responsibility of a human was to care for the gods in every way. Rituals provided food and drink for their gods. Temples provided houses for their gods. The gods became dependent on people to provide the luxury to which they were accustomed to and which they believed they deserved. In turn, the gods will provide for the people, so the people provide for them and protect the people whom they were providing. This defined the codependent relationship between gods and humans in the ancient world. It was a need-based system that comprised of religious responsibility that people had. The gods also interested in maintaining justice as among the people, not because the gods were inherently just or because of any sense of ethical right or wrong. Rather, the gods understood that society was plagued with lawlessness, violence, and disorder. The people would not be at liberty to carry out their ritual obligations. 
So there was this great big or this great symbiosis relationship between gods and humans. So Satan did not doubt that, that Job was a perfect and an upright man. He actually believed everything that God spoke about Job. But the real question was, was Job acting like every ancient Near Eastern person? That doing what he's doing will bring him favor from the gods. Which then brings us into another ancient Near Eastern thinking called the retribution principle. The premise lies that the righteous will prosper and the wicked will suffer. In verse number 11, the Bible says, Satan says, put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. And surely he will curse you to your face. Uh, the, the terminology for put forth your hand there literally means to send forth your hand as a man does strike a bow. You find examples of that in Genesis chapter 22 verse 12 and Exodus 3 verse 20. He said, put forth your hand. Strike him and he will curse you. He says, touch all that he has, meaning ruin him, strip him from his possessions. I want you to notice that Satan wanted God to do all of this. Notice the goal of Satan. He said, and he, Job, will surely curse you to your face. Another writer says it this way, see if Job will not renounce thee openly. In other words, if you strip Job of all that he has, he will openly curse you and renounce his worship towards you. The enemy doesn't want us to worship God. His whole purpose is to get us to curse God and renounce our devotion to him. The whole purpose of the enemy is for us to turn from God and renounce our devotion to to him. That's why your personal relationship with God must be deeply rooted. It's not because of what people, it's not what people see in church, it's what God sees in private. Because the truth is we could show a lot of things in church. We could show our outside exterior, but if we have no roots inside, when things come in our lives, we're going to renounce our worship to God. It's behind these closed doors, away from the public eye that God sees. When we see a tree, we only see what's on the outside of the ground. But if you were to dig underneath, you will see that it has roots that goes just as deep. What good is a marriage if the foundation of friendship, love, and communication is not deeply rooted, it's just two people that look the part, but is bound to fall apart. I'm going to say that one more time. What good is a marriage if the foundation of friendship, love, and communication is not deeply rooted? It's just two people that look the part, but is bound to fall apart. Satan really believed that Job was going to act in the way that he predicted. He believed that Job was going, was just following the ideology of the people of that day. Verse 12 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. And Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. All that he has is in your hand. Means in thy hand as in, in the margin. God removes his hand, his hedge, from around Job's possessions. But does not take them away as Satan has suggested. I want you to note this. It is only by God's permission that Satan can do what he will with restrictions 
only do not put forth your hand on him. I want you to know tonight, the devil can only go so far with you. And if he's taking you in a certain way, it's because God has given him a position. Or given him permission, rather. Brothers and sisters, the enemy can only do so much. He's still under God's control and power. He was allowed to, to, to in, in, injure or injure Job's possessions and anything that was connected to him, but could not touch Job himself. I can only imagine, I love this part, I could only imagine the overwhelming discomfort that Satan must have had while he was in the presence of the holy God, seeing that light always overcomes darkness. I could imagine Satan could not lift up his eyes to see the magnificent, the glorious, uh, and the splendor of the creator of everything. Brothers and sisters, if I could say anything to you about this, that when we are in our homes, we should make it uncomfortable for the enemy to spend any amount of time. There ought to be a sense of God's presence uh, that will torment the enemy. I mean, there has to be a glory that sits in every house, that sits on every life, that when the enemy comes, that he feels uncomfortable. I really do believe that while Satan was in the presence of a holy God and holy angels, that he was scratching and itching himself because he realized that I'm in front of a holy God. When we come back to church, we've got to make sure that we create a space for God's glory so that the enemy does not have room to block our praise and to block our worship. we got to do what the writer said happened in verse 12. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. we got to create an atmosphere of praise and worship that the enemy cannot stay in, that the enemy cannot stand, that the enemy cannot go through. we got to create a space of praise and worship, an atmosphere of this. Because when we do this, we don't give the enemy time to set up anything. For God inhabits the praises of his people. In the text, it's right down, I got to set up my own space of worship. I got to make sure I don't give room to the enemy. I got to make sure I don't allow the enemy to come in and take away what God has given me. And the only way to do that is by giving God spontaneous praise and worship. Spontaneous praise and worship. But though this all happened in glory, God has now given the enemy access to Job. And in verse 13 says, now on the day, now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Watch this. How often calamity comes to us when we least expect it. When everything is going well, when everything seems quiet and calm around us. When everything around us is prospering and we look, it looks like everything we touch or do is blessed and we tend not to see the dark gray patch of cloud above our heads. The children were enjoying their party. Job was probably in the house praying. Because we know in the earlier verses of chapter 1 of Job that whenever they had birthday celebration that went on for a week and at the end Job will bring all their sons and all his daughters out and he will consecrate them and set up sacrifice just in case they had cursed God in their heart. So Job was maybe he was on his knee praying to God to forgive his children in case they have erred in their celebration by sinning against the Lord. It was in this day that Job's Life will be turned upside down. It's this day that Satan will use all the resources available to him to cause Job to curse God to his face. It's this day that Job will look around him 
and realize that everything is taken away. It's this day that Job went through what he went through, not realizing that there was a meeting in glory. Not realizing that the enemy did not, did, did, did not come to him and say, listen, what about Job? But it was God that said, have you considered my servant Job? It, it was this day that the enemy now decided to push out and to do what it is that he was set out to do. What do you do when your day is turned upside down? Well, you see, a lot of us, if we hit our toe getting out the bed, we believe it's a bad day. If, if our car don't start in the morning, we, we believe it's a bad day. If we can't find something to wear, we, we believe it's a bad day. But I want to show you a bad day. I want to show you what a real bad day looks like. And, and not just a whole day, but, but within a span, I would say, of 20 minutes that Job had to go through. Verse 14 says, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the female donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabines attacked and took them. They also killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And, and, and I have escaped to tell you. But while he was Still speaking. The, the, the writer is trying to show us that, listen, the, 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 the rush of information came all at the same time. It wasn't an hour difference. It wasn't five minutes difference. It wasn't a half an hour difference. It was while the first was still speaking. Another one came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped. But while he was still speaking, another one came and said, the Chaldeans formed three units and made a raid on the camels and, and took them and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. A couple of weeks ago in part one, I told you that in those days, a man's worth is tied into what he had. And from verse 14 to verse 17, we just witnessed two attacks and one natural disaster that wiped out all of Job's livestock and servants. When it talks about the fire of God, scholars say that they're dealing with lightning showers. This did not occur one day after another. This happened at the same time. Not only his livestock, but there were, let, watch this, not only was their life, his livestock taken away, but if Job was to go outside from wherever he was and to look at the field, he will see nothing but dead bodies laying around. He will look and he will see men and women on the ground, bleeding, dying. This is a bad day. Brothers and sisters, when three messengers came one after the other and said, I alone have escaped, what they meant in other words was, they have hardly escaped alone to tell you. They were going to be killed too. But they escaped. But even though those were bad that would have nothing on what Job was about to hear. Because in verse number 18, while he was still speaking, this is the third messenger, while he was still speaking, another also came. I, I, I don't know what Job was thinking, but if it was me, I'd be like, don't touch the family. Just don't touch the family. Just don't touch the family. And this messenger came. I could see him shaking, saying, Job, master, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house on his birthday. And verse 19 will say, and behold, a great wind came across the wilderness 
and struck the four corners of the house. I could see Job now shaking, tears coming down his face, not knowing what to do, and it fell on them. Job was probably saying, please, let it just say they fell, but they got out okay. Please stop with the messaging now. Let it not say that they were inside of the house. Please don't continue the message, but stop it right there. But the messenger went on to say, and it fell on the young people, and they, please don't say that word, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. I can imagine the eyes of Job when he saw the, the fourth messenger coming and saying his sons and daughters were in the house and they died. If there was anything that Satan knew, he knew that if I could just get a hold of Job's family, it was certainly cause him to curse God and renounce his worship. If there's anything the devil thought he had Job in the corner. Maybe the livestock didn't matter. Maybe the servants didn't matter. But I know I got him because now his family is going to die, at least his sons and his daughters. I always wonder what happened to the wife, but then I realized that the wife made an entrance in chapter 2, and it wasn't for the fact of helping Job, but in the fact that she was helping the enemy Enemy, huh? For she spoke the word of the enemy. Huh? Why don't you curse God huh? and die? You gotta be careful who you have around you huh? because you don't want the wrong people huh? to give you the wrong advice huh? that will cause you huh? to leave the presence of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I can only see Job. Wondering how could this happen? This did not happen within these answers or, or these responses or these messages did not come within hours of each other. It came within the same moment of time. The truth is, after Satan has taken everything that Job had, after he has wiped out Job, and Job is, listen, I need you to understand this, but we're not going to get into it. But understand that just because Job lost everything, and Job had sores on his head to his feet, and they were burning, and they were hurting, and, they, and he took a rock, a uh, potter, and tried to scrape off his thing. That wasn't the only thing that Job was going through. Job also had to go through abandonment. The Bible says in Job, in the later chapters, that Job said, my breath offends my wife. It says, my friends have left me. Children don't want to come near me. Job was isolated to go through what he went through. The same man that was upright, the same man that was blameless, the same man that loved God and feared God, the same man that hated evil, the same man that was a voice for the voiceless, the same man was now left alone. Brothers and sisters, it would have been easy for Job to blame God. Let me tell you why. Him being attacked, we could say the enemy did that. But when Satan used lightning from glory, in our minds only God controls the weather. When he used the strong winds from the wilderness to come into the four corners of the house, only God can control the winds. So naturally, our minds will be like, God, how can you do this to me? How can you destroy everything I have? I can understand my livestock. I can understand the servants. But you brought a wind and you blew down the house that my children were in. He could have blamed God for all of this, seeing that Satan used natural disasters to do what he did. By this time, the word has gotten around that the greatest man of the East is being punished by the God of the universe. Because the mindsets 
of even believers is that if you're going through something bad, God is punishing you. That, 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 that's the mindset of Jewish believers. Remember that story of the blind man and, and the apostles and, and Jesus came to him and, and they asked, um, God, who, who did sin? The, this man or his parents? Because sin was always associated with suffering. But Jesus' answer was, none of them, but for the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, Job does something in the next verse that really, really, I think we should take really big note of. In verse 20, it says, then Job arose and tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell to the ground and he worshiped. It wasn't until the last news came about his children that stirred Job. The loss of everything else didn't move him. The loss of servants didn't move him. But the loss of his children drove him to his knees to worship. James Shouter says this, worship is a personal encounter with God in which one expresses his love for God and concentrates on his attributes and brings the focus back to God. In other words, what Job was doing, that though my situation is bad, I'm still going to worship you. Even though I'm going through hell, I'm still going to bow myself to you. I'm going to take my focus off what's around me and put my focus back on God. If there's anything that we need to do, we need to put our focus back on God. If there's anything that we need to do is we got to lift our hands and say, God, I love you. God, I adore you. Because the truth of the matter is, if you read the book of Job, God never answered Job why he went through what he went through. We got to worship him. We got to have an encounter with him. We got to change our focus from our situation to what it is that is happening. If there's anything I want you to learn tonight in terms of studying the Bible, whenever you're introduced to a new character, I want you to note the first things that come out of his mouth. We've never heard Job talk. We've never heard Job say a word throughout this time. But now he opens his mouth for the first time. And what does he say? Naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. That Job was a worshiper. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything that we need to grasp, if there's anything that we need to hold on to, we need to understand that material things are not to hold us captive, but we hold it. What does that mean? It means it's easier to let go of something you control than it control you. Everything we have in this life was given by God on loan. There is nothing that you have that belongs to you. The house you have, the car you have, the spouse you have, the children you have, the money you have, the ministry you run, it does not belong to you, but it belongs to to the Lord. And once we understand this, uh, we will understand Job's position. Uh, Though the enemy invaded my territory, uh, God is still worthy uh, to be praised. Uh, even though uh, the storms may come, uh, the wind may blow, uh, I still know uh, that God is worthy to be praised. Brothers and sisters, we can't take anything with us when our time is up or when God takes it back. We have to realize that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, they and the world that dwells therein. There is nothing that we can do. But when God strips us, we just got to endure. When God tries us, we just got to endure. When God tests us, we just gotta endure huh? when we go through hell huh? we just gotta endure huh? what made Job so strong huh? what made Job huh? be able to stand against uh, the wiles of the enemy huh? is simply this huh? I know yes brother Dean huh? I know in whom huh? I worship huh? I know the God huh? I worship huh? I know the one huh? that has brought me this far huh? and as he brought me this far huh? I will continue to worship. It was Job's theology or his belief in God 
that caused him to worship and bless the Lord. What kept Job in this difficult time was his personal relationship with God. It's time to go deeper. It's time to go higher. It's time to open back up the word. It's time to go back in prayer. It's time to open it all back because though the devil comes, we got to realize that we still serve a God that is able to turn it around. You still serve a God that is able to turn dark to to light. He's still God that could turn any circumstances around. Though the enemy comes at me like a flood, I will stand strong. I will bow myself. I will lift my hands because the good Lord giveth and the good Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, understand that Job was not worried about what was lost. Job was not worried about what was taken. Job's relationship held him through the storm. It's time, even now, you're not in church. The doors are locked. You're in your house. It's time to get into the word. It's time to study the word. It's time to pray again. It's time to read again. It's time to grow deeper. Yes, God. So when I come back into the building and they see me jumping, it's not because I'm trying to show off. It's not because I want to be on the video. It's not because I want people to talk about me. But it's because when I was in my little house, I was growing deeper in the word of God. So now, when I come to church, when I come, yes, God, when I come to church and I hear Pastor preach, I understand what he's saying because in my quiet time, I heard God. And now, when I come to the house, it's now just confirmation of the word in which I've heard throughout the week. Why? Because my roots are grounded in God. Let the storm come, let COVID come, let sickness come, but I know in whom I worship. I worship the true and living God. There is none like him. Brothers and sisters, understand that you serve the true and living God and that there is none like him in all the earth. Job, through all that he went through, was having a terrible day, was having a bad day, was having a messed up day, but somehow his relationship with God did not shake. So much so that in chapter 2, when the Satan was with the assembling of the angels, God looked back at him again and said, have you considered Job? Have you seen him? Though you try to tear him down, he held on to his integrity. Brothers and sisters, you have to endure as a good soldier. Brothers and sisters, you have to endure and hold on to your integrity. Whether I'm in front of people or behind closed doors, my integrity must stay intact. Yes, God. That's why Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I do this to my God? His integrity was intact. Brothers and sisters, no matter what you go through, make sure your integrity stays strong. No matter the trial, no matter the test, no matter what the enemy brings your way, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the truth is, we may never know why we go through what we go through. You may pray, you may seek God's face, you may come before him in tears, 
But there are just some things that God just won't show. Through all of this, Job, Job cried to God, petitioned God, but at the end of the day, God still did not answer. There are some things we're going to have to wait till we see him face to face to get that answer. In my closing, there's a pastor in BC that I heard talked about an experience with a brother in his church, him and his wife were going through some situations and infidelity happened and the man, the husband, fell into sin. And he went to the pastor, the name was Pastor Mark, and he said, Pastor Mark, I, I, I've tried everything. I, I told her I'm not going to do it again. I, I, I told her she could trust me. I, I gave her all my passwords. I've done all these things so that she could trust me again. And she's just not trusting me. And how he responded back held this in my heart. And let's just say his name was Jason. I don't know what his real name was. But he said, Jason, you keep on doing what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, your reward will come when you're in heaven. Some things we just have to endure and know that God is sovereign and know that he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all the, that he's in full control of it all. When we understand the sovereignty of God, we understand problems aren't as bad as they seem because it all works for the good of them that trust in the Lord. Verse 22 says this. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Through everything that he went through, to the news reports of his livestock being wiped away, his servants being wiped away, his children being wiped away, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Whenever we're, whatever we go through this year, let this be the outcome of all of our situations. A matter of fact, read it with me. Take away Job's name and put your name in there. Put your name in there. Through all this, Mark did not sin, nor did he blame God. Let that be the outcome. Let that be the desire. That though I'm going through so much mess now, I know God is sovereign and he is good. There is nothing that catches God by surprise. If you're going through it, it's because he sanctioned it. And if he sanctioned it, I love this. He won't put more on you than you could bear. He won't put more on you than you could bear. So much so, so much so that he will make a way of escape. This is what God would do if he sanctions us to go through testings and go through trials. Father, we thank you tonight. We honor you, we adore you. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that as we are here before you tonight, Lord, we've been through things that has really wiped us out. Some of us has been through a divorce. Some are having discussions about divorce. Some have lost jobs. Some were kicked out of school. Some can't pay their bills. Some have lost friends and family. Lord, I pray that you will speak a word into the situation and allow them to say like Job, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. That through it all we'll still lift our hands and bow our faces to the ground in worship. And know that there is none like you in all the earth. Lord, we magnify you tonight. We bless you tonight. We adore you tonight. When the enemy invades, I pray that worship will be our attack back. When the enemy comes in like a flood, I pray that worship will be what we do. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you now. Have your way, Lord God, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. I pray that the Lord will bless you this week. I pray that worship will be your choice weapon to combat the invasion of the enemy. And that you will take this time to grow your roots in Christ so that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. God bless you. See you this Wednesday for our pre-service chat and for our Bible study. God bless you. Have a fabulous week. In Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed our Sunday worship service. If you were blessed by the service, be sure to hit the subscribe button for more APC content. We are also thankful for our partners. Your continued financial support allows us to continue producing and posting new content every week. If you would like to partner and support the work of APC, please visit apcpickering.com give and give generously today. If you have a prayer request or any questions about the Bible, we'd love to hear from you. Visit apcpickering.com contact and chat with us anytime. Take care and God bless. Thank you.